fair, accurate, to the point. This is Face the State on Montana's news station. Well, good morning. Thank you for joining us for Face the State on this Sunday. As you can tell, we are at the Museum of the Rockies. The Museum of the Rockies is known for its look at history, but when most of us think of the Museum of the Rockies, they think of the prehistory found in dinosaurs like Big Mike, the statue out in front, or the planetarium that explores the history of the universe. Well, for the past 25 years, there's another piece of history that's been a big part of life here at the Museum of the Rockies. It's the Living History Farm. For the next half hour, we're going to take a little look at Montana's history, a little more manageable than that of Big Mike. Just outside the front doors of the Museum of the Rockies is the Living History Farm. Our tour guide this morning, a perfect person to give us a tour. Dave Kinsey, come join us, Dave, here for a second. Dave, you are the, uh, for all intents and purposes, you're the farm manager for the Living History Farm, is that right? I am, Chet. I've been down here for, this is going to be my 16th year doing that here, and 20th year at the Museum of the Rockies, so. Now, in other words, let's uh, just walk a little bit here, Dave. As we talk about this Living History Farm, it really is living history, isn't it? I mean, the work that's going on here is pretty reflective of what was going on turn of the century, turn of the 19th century in Montana, wasn't it? You bet, like our, our goal here is to really have a, a kind of a not, a not a static museum exhibit, but a working living exhibit that has to do with Montana homesteading and Montana agriculture. Mm. And uh, so we try to do what they would have done the time period 1890, and that's mm -hmm. what we work on here. Well, let's, uh, as we talk about this though, I think a lot of people maybe see the uh, the homestead house off to the next and say, wow, great job, you built this thing that looks really authentic. This is as authentic a, a location as you possibly can get, isn't it, Dave? This is truly a Montana homestead home. It is, actually. The Tinsley House is what I like to call the museum's largest artifact. So we moved that house that you will see here. Mm -hmm. um, we moved it here in 1986 whole. So we brought the whole thing in here on a truck, mm -hmm. restored it, and brought it in period appropriate uh, restoration. And yeah, I, I consider it our largest museum artifact. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't even know we're down here, though. So. Well, and for 25 years, the, uh, the Living History Farm has been open here at the Museum of the Rockies. Um, give me an idea of, of just, if, if you can, the significance of that. You're bringing the Tinsley home in here, uh, it, it, it's all about that authenticity, isn't it? I mean, that's what you're working for every day here. It is. You know, our goal is when you step through the gate that we just walked through, we want you to come down to 1890. So we want you to take a step back in time and experience what a little bit of what they would have experienced in 1890 being a Montana homesteader uh, and Montana it's got a really uh, rich homesteading history it's it's the most homestead claims filed of any state mm -hmm. so it really is I think a big part of our history that a lot of people are still learning about today so what, what, what does it take to do this, Dave? I mean, I'm talking about the, the, the effort that goes into this. You're open during the summer and, and you have all these people helping you do all. I mean, what, what goes into making uh, the Living History Farm continue to live? You know, this is our 25th anniversary, so uh, our goal really has been to, uh, it, it, it takes a lot of work. We have a staff, a really limited staff, because it's, it's, we're a nonprofit, mm -hmm. but uh, we have a lot of volunteers who help us out down here. So they go through an extensive training uh, period, and we get people brushed up on their Montana history and homesteading history and uh, history of the U.S., 1890, and the homestead movement. And we have uh, a trainings for that. And so it takes, it takes a large number of people to get this uh, up and off the ground. And we get the question all the time, why? aren't you open year round? And I'm so glad we're not because it's so much work. <laughs> to have hands-on uh, exhibits for people is really a lot more work than having a static exhibit that you can just come in and look at, you know? The, the part that's always fun for me is, is I've been to many museums and they have these beautiful dioramas and you go up and push a button and this yeah. mechanical taped voice comes on and tells you something about right. that. Yours is really living. The folks are here and they answer questions and they're able to tell you that that part must be really fun for the participants but really challenging too because you never know what kind of questions going to be that's, asked of you. That's exactly right and so you really have to have your you gotta have your base knowledge down for a job like this but you also have to be a people person and you're gonna get questions about everything 
uh, from the social, political <laughs> things that are happening to what kind of flower is that right over there and what's, the, you know, what's this and what's that and how's this house made and so your knowledge base, it takes a bit of extensive knowledge base to get going. A lot of the people, there's people that have been working down here uh, longer than I've been here so they've, they've been here since the Tinsley House opened. 25 years they've been volunteer, volunteering here so uh, some of them are just fantastic resources for us. But the whole idea is that you have someone to talk to you. We don't sign everything that's down here. We have a very limited signing uh, so that you have to, you know, talk with somebody to, to learn what's, what's going on down here and they need to talk with you. So that's our goal is to have people interpret living history. That's the part that's really fun to watch though, especially for the young people because they're always told, don't touch, don't, exactly. and, and there's a lot of things that you, the big sign out in front of big, don't yeah. climb on, don't do all of that. But here you have to interact with it. And, and right. it's really fun to watch them hang back and I don't know what I'm supposed to do now yeah. as you know, they're cooking or, or blacksmithing or whatever else is going on. Right. And we'll show you some of that here a bit, little bit later. Um, it takes a while for people to get into that exactly. mode, doesn't it? A lot of times parents will be come down and they'll bring their kids and they'll be like, don't touch this <laughs> down here. And then it's, well, this is the place where you can touch things and you can uh, try kneading the bread. You can load your arms up with firewood and like bring it up to the wood box. You can fill up a water container with water and water the garden. And that's the whole idea behind uh, what we do down here is it's a hands-on, as much as we can do with mm -hmm. a visitor, hands-on. So you can experience a little bit of that, but also take in some of the facts and the history of it. And I think it's really a good combination, especially for young people, because they get a better idea, rather just reading in a text or looking at a photo. Mm -hmm. um, not that those aren't good references for people, but it's nice to bring it home and you know, internalize it a little bit. Well, let, let's walk a little bit, take sure. a look at it. One of the things that always impresses me about it is, is, and we have some young people now looking at it, is you have this garden. I mean, yeah. you're actually, you're, you're, you're farming. You're, I mean, you're doing the part. This is a living history farm exactly. and you are doing that part of it. We have this beautiful garden behind and, and you yeah. take care of it just like the homesteaders would have to. We do, <laughs> we, uh, we, you know, our garden is actually an heirloom garden, so everything mm -hmm. we plant here has to be of our time period. Right. So 1890 is the vegetable and flower varieties that you see down here mm -hmm. are going to be what, what they would have grown then or what was available mm -hmm. then. And we, we've researched this. We work pretty hard at this to try to get it right. And that's another part of being at the museum is like we're a museum and we need to, we need to get this right. So we need to know mm -hmm. uh, what they planted and, you know, the varieties they grew. And so we'll try all those out. And we've been doing that now for, for ever since I started uh, with some volunteers mm -hmm. uh, for 16 years. And I think we've kind of refined our uh, heirloom garden to where we have a lot of varieties that work in Montana and they're all, they're all 1890. So they're open pollinated, not hybrids. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it's really fun, a fun project. The history of plants and, and, uh, the history of like what people grew is really an amazing uh, story in itself. You know, half of probably 75% of what you grow in your garden is not native to the U.S. So mm. it had to come from somewhere. Mm. Where did these guys get it? You know, lilacs that you see around every homestead, those are native to China. You know, it's like mm. where did these homesteaders get those, and why were they so important that they brought those back here? You know, and so those kind of stories I think are really interesting. Um, and it's, it's a fair amount of work, but it's really, that, that part of it is, is really f a fun project. And, you know, the other interesting part for us is that we try to tie this into MSU and, mm -hmm. and uh, we use the, the data. They had the, back in 1895, they were, uh, you know, right when Montana College started over here, they were mm -hmm. doing tests on tomatoes and corn and things like that. Mm -hmm. And they kept track of all that. So we use, I go over to the library and we research what they grew and then we find those varieties and then we try to find those seed varieties to see if they're still around so hmm. you know that part of it is is fun detective work and then it's also we're using somebody a long ago kept track of all that and we're using it now you know 125 years later so it's uh you know interesting we had big storms this week here as well and it, yeah. I, I think it would have been really easy to come out here <laughs> with some of that fancy wrap from some hardware I, store and cover it up too it's still authentic. It, yeah. You're going to deal with it just like everybody else did oh, in yeah. 1890. We've had some bad years. We've <laughs> had some years where we've had hail damage and we've had a really nice garden and it's wiped out, you know, the stalk sticking out of the ground. And so then we don't have a lot for people to see in the story as well. 
we got wiped out by hail and this is what it looks like when that happens you know and and we tell that story as well it's not as interesting but uh people are people are amazed by it um uh, you know it is uh we we have to do what we can do we try to water this by hand mm -hmm. when we're open to the public occasionally if it gets really dry i'll cheat and bring the hose down here but um we do the the gardeners that work here there's probably i think 10 gardeners this year um maybe more um that work on the garden and so we water by hand and we try to get the kids to help water by hand as well so it's always fun to watch them too because this is their garden and they take this as seriously as if they were living off of the food that's going to come out of this at right. some point that do you find the folks get into this i mean yes. you like you said we walk through the gate and yeah, this is their yeah. for the time they're here. This is their home, or this is their garden, yeah. or this is their blacksmith yeah. shop, whatever. Yeah, I, a lot of times the volunteers who work here will call it their house. It's like our house down here, and they they've worked here for so long. It's, they're very uh, they're very possessive about it, and it's uh, it's actually a really good thing because they they take it on and uh, and uh, they help that helps tell the story. You know, it's mm. really it's really great. Um, I think the you know. The part for us that's uh, important is that people get a little sampling of it, but they're not, and a lot of times people will stay, uh, yesterday we had a family stay like for three hours, just just touring around with their kids, and you get that occasionally. A lot of people are in a hurry, they come through in 15 minutes and they're done, mm -hmm. whereas sometimes we'll get down here, you can hang out down here as long as you want, you can come back, and we'll, they'll come back the next day in the morning mm -hmm. and uh, see what it's like in the morning down here because they were here in the evening, and so it's really... I think pretty fun. Uh, that that's the part I really enjoy. I would much rather have people have a quality experience down here than having you know a lot of people come through in a day is not our is not my goal anyway. Mm -hmm. My goal is that it's a quality experience for them and that they they get something out of it. And uh, that's mm -hmm. kind of what we're all about. L let's venture over to another area because sure. I know you got some work. It's this is an ongoing project too, isn't it? I mean, work is constantly. <laughs> constantly going on to 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 renovate to maintain exactly. all of that yeah it's a the the hard part of it is like the Tinsley house is very old mm -hmm. and so it's been restored but it still is you know a hundred and well 25 years old and so we have 30,000 people a, a year going through it so that part of it is also difficult wow. where it's like the repair and the maintenance of the place gets to be extensive sure um, but we're also adding to the farm uh, as well. And so the, we've added a, a barn, a dairy barn, and brought that in here whole, just like the Tinsley house as oh, well. Well, let's so. go take a look at that. Right. Well, Dave, we've worked our way to the uh, far end of the existing uh, uh, living history farm. As you were telling me as we were walking down here, though, this whole big chunk of property out here is in trust to the museum. So. Correct. As we were walking, talking about the homestead, you build your lean-to and then you add a floor. Yeah. And you're, you're kind of doing the same thing. You've really yeah. kind of homesteaded here, haven't you? Yeah, that's a common homesteading story <laughs> for Montana, really. With, you know, a lot of times people with their original homestead claim would be 160 acres, mm -hmm. and that was what you ended up with. You could purchase it or you could prove up on it by making improvements. Mm -hmm. And then they would end up buying a neighbor's place nearby. Maybe he tried it and he sold out to you because he couldn't do it or whatever happened he maybe he died you know mm -hmm. and that's how that's how ranches grew in Montana um, and and like I say we have a really rich homesteading history here at, and my family actually homesteaded here <laughs> uh, and my grand my great granddad did in 1895 and then my granddad did later on in the 1900s over oh. out in eastern Montana so mm -hmm. two generations and that happened with the Tinsleys as well so mm -hmm people sort of spread out once you once you have the land you know mm. behind us is this barn the, the newest addition in many ways to the living history farm work in progress exactly. you, you've brought this in it was a working dairy barn you it tell me it was yeah it, it came off of um, East Baseline and Walker Road right up there uh, you know outside of the airport up up in the foothills of the of the bridgers over mm. there and uh, it's the it's the Lincoln Barn is what is what uh, this one was, and it, it was on a piece of property there, and it was donated to the museum. So, mm -hmm. so the Gorman family that was buying the um, property uh, donated this barn to the museum, and uh, we have one of our volunteers, uh, Ivy Huntsman. She uh, is 
one of the people that is the real advocate for this barn. To, she's always on me on how come you're not getting that restored <laughs> sooner, Dave, you know? Um, but we're working on it a little at a time. So we moved this into her hole and, we've, and now we've replaced the roof, a new foundation, new floor, and now we're daubing the outside of it. We're filling in the chinking. And it's uh, it's a dairy barn, so it has the milking stanchions inside. And this is another part of uh, the history of how homesteads work. And, I, and you're right, that's how, that's what we've done as well is try to just keep expanding a little bit down here. And we try to keep this program alive by doing that and making it interesting for people to come back and see new things. So, what do you envision happening here as this is this restoration? What what are folks going to see here a few years down the road when the Lincoln Barn is yeah. is a, a, an active part of the living history? Barn? You know what we'd really like to do, and this is as you know all determined by whether we can afford it or not. But mm -hmm. um, we'd really like to have our milk cows in here and show the milk cow the whole process of having milk in a cow and making butter and mm. um, having some animals down here because we have the land. And we, uh, it would be a really, I think, interesting project for people to see. So uh, that's our goal is to use it as it was used, which is kind of what the Living History Farm is about, mm -hmm. and, um, and get people to see that so they can come churn some butter from a cow that we milked, you know, it's perfect. that kind of a thing. Oh, good luck with the, the project on the Lincoln Barn. Yeah, what a great a addition. Yeah, this is fun one. It's a really great, I, I love old barns, and it was nice to be able to save this barn and bring it here. And so uh, well, here, here we go. We keep it going. Perfect. One of our uh, pieces of uh, historic lore for the United States is Johnny Appleseed, right. planting apple trees. But that was a big part of what was going on at Homestead. I mean, we had yeah. the apple trees here. That was a that was a significant part of a, a homesteader's life, wasn't it? You know, it's one of the ways you could prove up on your homestead. So you, if you if you needed to prove up on your homestead to, to make your claim final. Mm. Um, you could do it by building structures, you could do it by irrigation, and you could do it by planting orchards. And apple orchards are one of the things they did plant in Montana. And in fact, you know, that's one way you, if you go around Montana, a lot of times you'll see out in the middle of this river bottom, you'll see a bunch of apple trees there. There's no structures left or anything. There's just a bunch of apple trees there and they're old. That is somebody's homestead that's no longer there because they had planted apple trees and and uh, use those as part of the way of proving up on their homestead. And the Department of Ag really encouraged people to do that. They really, they had, you know, brochures and uh, plans for people to do on their homestead. And that was one of the things that they recommended people do. Uh, Montana's a tough place to grow apples though, so only a few varieties can really make it here. Um, and a lot of the older varieties, which these are, um, they do make it here and they make a, a nice apple. Hmm. They make a pretty good pie? They make a great pie and they make good cider too. <laughs> oh, perfect. That's good to know. Let's uh, keep, just keep walking here. You've got this uh, set up here with some of uh, the transportation and tools of the day as well. I, I find this, this is always kind of fun for me to go to because um, not everybody had a garage, but you, right. you have one here at the Living History that's Farm. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, we have kind of a mishmash of uh, equipment in here. And, mm. Uh, actually, that's the part that I really love. That's what my mm. my interest really was. I'm from the college. I got my degree from MSU College of Ag, and so mm. the history of agriculture was really what I liked. And mm. I know less about the political uh, and social ramifications, and I know more about this. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so we keep a little sampling. There's a there's a mower in here that you would use to cut hay, and a and a plow, um, sleighs, wagons, and and we try to. Everything down here is usable, so mm. that's the difference for our collection here, for the Living History Collection, is that, you know, if you if you take something into the main museum collection, the goal is that it lasts forever, and we keep it in collections, and we don't let people mm. touch it, and we don't let light get on it, and we don't, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we want to keep it forever, and the collection down here is a teaching collection, so our goal is, like, to try to show people how things work and let them try to use it, if we can, mm. um, without, you know, cutting off any fingers or anything. Um, <laughs> we, we try to have people try things out and see how things work. And like the mowing machine right there is really interesting. It's all horse drawn, powered by horses. Everything is just from the motion of being pulled, cuts, cuts the hay, you know, and it's a really great invention, you know, from mm -hmm. 1890, 1900. Uh, and it's, I think fascinating stuff. So I just find it fascinating how some of this stuff gets here, Dave. Because you know now, if, if I need to fix my lawnmower, yeah. I throw it on the flatbed or throw it back of the truck, drive yeah. down to the place, get it taken care of. Um, where we're standing now 
is a long way from Fort Benton if you were coming right. by riverboat. Exactly. You're a long way from the ocean and there's a whole lot of mountains to haul something That's like that. Right. It, do you always just find yourself amazed that this stuff is here I, because it didn't just get here by itself? You know, everything from pianos to, I mean, to mining equipment, you know, the railroad doesn't get to Bozeman until like 1888, I think, mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, before that, Fort Benton is where people had to have things shipped in, and so that that's a that's a ride from there to Virginia City to Bannock to Helena, places like that. You know, you're shipping goods a long ways, and uh, we've done some really interesting research too. On I've gotten some store ledgers from different stores, and I have one from a store way up in Pony, Montana, which is kind of a mining town in the middle mm -hmm. of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And the things that he brought in there in 1880s, in the 1880s, you'd be astounded at what he what he got and canned goods like oysters and all really? kinds of interesting things in here. And you say, how did they get that stuff here? But they did. They did get it here, and uh, and it's an amazing thing. And the really great part is people donate to us. They'll donate a piece of equipment to us, and it might need work, but they want it to be used. They're, they would rather have it be used and want it to come to the Living History Farm, so we get that a lot as well. This building actually is what was the size of the Tinsley's first homestead cabin, or near nearabouts mm. as far as we can tell. Um, it is what they started out in, but now we're using it as our, as our farm blacksmith shop. So. The farm blacksmith shop is basically where you would make repairs to metal and equipment and also do a lot of shoeing, do your own shoeing for horses mm -hmm. and uh, things like that. So it's not it's not a commercial blacksmith shop like they would have had in downtown Bozeman in 1880, but it's mm -hmm. like what somebody would have had on their place to fix things and shoe their horses and, you know, keep everything up and running. So, sure. yeah, coal-fired. Uh, forge and well, I think people forget about some of that. I mean, even if you were homesteading right here, to get to that blacksmith shop in downtown Bozeman, yeah. that, that's going to take up a big chunk of your day. By yeah. the time you get in there, get it made, come back out here, you, you don't have that kind of time. You 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 were pretty self sufficient. You had to do it yourself. That's right, and it would also be expensive. You mm. know, like if you most people knew how to put a shoe on their horse, and uh, un unless you didn't have horses and. Mm -hmm. uh, if you did, you know, you would need that skill and you would need to be able to do that without having to go to town. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of what the homestead movement was about as well, was being self-sufficient and being on the land. And a lot of times those people could not afford um, to do, you know, make repairs or have somebody else do it. So they needed to be able to do it themselves, you know. And, uh, Who lived on a homesteading farm in the 1880s? you wouldn't get a lot of privacy. What else do you notice? The family that owned the house... And blacksmith as well, so uh, not a lot of them, but there <laughs> were some, and um, we've got great photos of, of women blacksmiths as well. But uh, you're right, you know, I, I, I've also all had people tell me, well, the men wouldn't be in the kitchen cooking, and, and that's not true either. Mm -hmm. You know, when you think about the, the population base of Montana, it's like... There were not. There were way more men than women. So how they must have been cooking something because mm -hmm. they all survived and ate something. <laughs> um, so I think that's the other part of what we try to do down here is get rid of some of those stereotypes or those those kind of myths that people have about uh, the West and homesteading. So um, that's also our goal down here is to change the story a little bit. It's not it's not uh, bonanza mm. or you know. Uh, I don't know, like Gunsmoke, <laughs> well, those are great TV shows, but that's not really the true story. It, it's a little sampling, but it's not the real story, of, especially the Montana story. Dave, we've worked our way back over to the house here, and uh, joining us is uh, Angie Weikert. Uh, Angie, let's talk about what this means to the Museum of the Rockies, because I, we started this broadcast by talking about the planetarium and the history-rich environment that's there, mm -hmm. the dinosaurs, the prehistory part of it, and this yeah. is a, a much narrower version, but no <laughs> less important part of the history, yeah. certainly of Montana. What, how does this all fit in, the Living History Farm, for, for the, the plan of the museum? Yeah, well, part of the museum is preserving our past, um, and especially our, our history here in Montana. And so mm -hmm. um, the Living History Farm itself showcases that, but more importantly, it brings it to life. So mm -hmm. um, you can see um, the, the amount of school kids that are around that mm -hmm. in this environment, it allows us to really showcase who we are as people of Montana, where we've come from, and, mm -hmm. 
and you can you can touch things and that's the biggest part you know you see all of the families and all the kids get attracted to areas of the museum that they can sit down and interact and play and touch and the whole farm is like that the, the part that's always fun for me to watch is when families come through dinosaurs are are hard to relate to they're big and mm -hmm. and they have all of that and kids love that yeah but this when they come here you, you'll hear a mom or a dad say, this is how grandma lived. This yeah. is what it looked like where grandpa, or it, it makes it so much more, th I mean, in a lot of ways, this is the real personal part of the Museum of the Rockies, isn't it? It is, yeah, it is. So there's a lot of uh, pieces in here that people can identify with and still have in their homes as, as uh, family heirlooms. Um, and one of the things that I especially love about um, the Living History Farm is that it's using the Tinsley family really showcases, mm. you know, using that one family in particular, um, uh, really, you can you can get a, an idea of what it would have been like. You know, we've got folks that are cooking in there as they would have cooked in the 1890s, and um, you know, we were just washing some, pretend to wash some clothes or churn mm -hmm. some butter, and mm -hmm. um, and all of those things are uh, have been. Uh, part of our past before so we, we toured the new barn the Lincoln barn yeah. has been a part of this and I know that um, Thanks to the uh, the Jenny family uh, th this has become part of the museum as well I mean th the the future is Dave and I had talked about yeah. it earlier it much like homesteading was you'd start with the little lean-to and then it would add on and go Future plans. I mean yeah. tell me wh where do you see this going or, or is it just a, a constant work in progress and we'll have to wait and see <laughs> Well, that's that's part of it for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. so um, as Dave um, manages the, the buildings and the, the history portion, what I do is the programming. And mm -hmm. what we would love to do with the Living History Farm is really make it, you know, one of the showcase pieces of the museum and mm -hmm. bring it the attention that it deserves. So mm -hmm. we've done that. We've started that with programming this year and bringing um, Wednesday, Wild West Wednesdays in, Simple Saturdays. And mm -hmm. um, we've got programming for adults with hops and history. So mm -hmm. we'd love for the farm to be programmatically a destination that people come to. Mm. It, it's a great place to escape too. We were talking about it earlier. Is it, it's awesome. it's so much simpler here. I mean, it's yeah. hard. It, the work is hard. You're splitting wood. You're cooking over a fire. Yeah. You're, you're blacksmithing your own shoes or whatever. But it, it I don't know. It, it, there's a piece to some of that. At least for me. Do you find yourself just escaping the back door of the museum once in a while <laughs> and coming down and just wandering around? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely. Um, that's it's funny that you say that because there's a lot of staff and, and volunteers too that you know will come down and just sit in the kitchen and mm -hmm. spend time with the Living History Farm volunteers mm -hmm. and drinking the cowboy coffee or eating the coffee cake that they make mm -hmm. um, and and just taking a step back because things run a lot slower here than they do um, mm -hmm. in the rest of the, the rest of the museum. The, the the part that I also find too is your volunteers to make all of this work is just incredible. They yeah. they they you maybe drove here in your car, mm -hmm. but when they come through that gate, it's 1890 and they yep. take it, I mean, I think they really believe this is where they live. They yeah. really get into it, don't they? <laughs> yeah, there are some kids that I think on a daily basis ask our volunteers, like, is this yes. your house? Um, because you it's so authentic. Here, yeah. yeah, they do. Um, and it's, you know, we have 70 volunteers that put in hundreds, thousands of hours every mm. year making this place run. And it's that attention to detail and attention to that historical accuracy that, that provokes those questions of, is this your house? So, so it's going to be here. 25 years later, it's going to continue to grow oh, and yeah. change and, and develop as, uh, as the museum. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a really important part of the museum. Perfect. Again, Angie Weicker, Dave Kinsey joining Thank us here. We are on the steps of the uh, Tinsley House at the, the Living History Farm at the Museum of the Rockies. We thank you for joining us for this edition of Face the State. We hope the rest of your Sundays a pleasant day. Thanks for watching Face the State. This has been a presentation of Montana's news station. Fair, accurate, to the point.